Please start, sir. Good afternoon. It's indeed a pleasure and honor to welcome the distinguished, uh, distinguished speakers and the audience who has joined us virtually on this occasion of book launch of the book, India, a Federal Union of States, Fault Lines, Challenges and Opportunities, authored by Dr. Madhav Kurbole. To begin with, I invite Shri K. N. Srivastava, formerly Secretary Government of India and currently Director India International Center to welcome and introduce the speakers. Mr. Shri. Good afternoon, everybody. Sri Muhammad Hamid Ansari, former Vice President of India and Chief Guest of today's program. Sri N.N. Bora, President India and International Center and Chair of today's event. Justice A.P. Shah, Professor Faizan Mustafa, Sri Gurcharan Das, Dr. Madhav Godbale, ladies and gentlemen. I extend a very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of India International Center. Mohammed Havind Ansari, the chief guest, would be releasing today a very interesting book entitled India, a Federal Union of States, Fault Lines, Challenges and Opportunities, authored by Dr. Madhav Godbole. Though the chief guest, chairperson and the speakers do not need any introduction, nevertheless, it is my duty to briefly introduce them to you. Sri Mohammed Havind Ansari, he is a distinguished for, former IFS officer, served as India's ambassador to Australia, Afghanistan, Iran, Saudi Arabia, as also permanent representative of India to United Nations. After his retirement from government service, Sri Ansari served as Vice Chancellor of Aligarh Muslim University between 2002-2002, thereafter a chairman of National Commission of Minority between 2006-2007. Thereafter, he was elected as Vice President of India and served in that capacity for about a decade between 2007 to 2017. He is a very well-known scholar. Sri N. N. Bora, President India International Center, is recipient of Padma Bhushan, is a distinguished former IS officer whose service career and post-retirement engagements reflect the decades-long experience he has of working in the security management arena, which commenced in end 1962, when he was inducted into the Intelligence Bureau and later trained under the SAS of uh, United Kingdom. Sevora served as governor of JNK for a period of over 10 years, between 2008 to 2018, and earlier served as Home Secretary, Government of Punjab, after Operation Blue Star, as Secretary Defense Production, Defense Secretary, Union Home Secretary, Principal Secretary of the Prime Minister, member of the first National Security Advisory Board, and Chairman National Task Force on Internal Security. Justice A.P. Shah. Justice Ajit Prakash Shah graduated from Government Law College, Mumbai. After practicing as a lawyer for some time, he became additional judge of Bombay High Court in 1992 and later a permanent judge of the court in 1994. He served as Chief Justice of Madras High Court and thereafter that of Delhi High Court. Justice Shah has been the chairperson of a Broadcasting Content Complaints Council, that is BCC, a self-regulatory body for non-news general entertainment channels set up by the Indian Broadcasting Foundation. Professor Faizan Mustafa, currently Vice Chancellor of Nalsar University of Law, Hyderabad, is a well-known constitutional teacher, recipient of Commonwealth Scholarship. He is also a Fulbright Scholar. He has authored eight books and contributed more than 250 articles. Sri Gurcharan Das is an author and former CEO of Procter & Gamble India has studied philosophy from Harvard University and later attended Harvard Business School. He has authored several books, one of the prominent one being India Unbound, which narrates the story of India, the country's economic liberalization unfolded in 1992 onwards. Dr. Madhav Godbole, a postgraduate and a PhD in economics from Bombay University, Dr. Godbole joined IAS in the year 1959 
Some of his important assignments in his civil service career include Chairman of Maharashtra Electric Board, Principal Finance Secretary Government of Maharashtra, Union Home Secretary. He took voluntary retirement in March 1993. He has authored 26 books on public policy in English and Marathi. These books have also been trans translated in a few other languages. He writes weekly columns for some leading dailies. Now I hand over the floor to the chairperson of today's event, Sri N.N. Vora, and request him to conduct the today's proceedings. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, eminent panelists, all the participants in today's discussion. Uh, our director, Mr. Srivastava, has introduced all the panelists. So I will not take more time in saying anything about my former colleague, Dr. Godbole, and the other eminent panelists. Yes. Before we commence the, the program this afternoon, I'll call upon Dr. Godbole to briefly speak on the salient content or the salient issues in his book because there are a host of issues which he has covered in the 350 pages. And my own personal suggestion to him is if he chooses to speak, on some of the issues which he thinks are more important than the others. Dr. Godbole, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm grateful to Sri Vora for consenting to preside over this webinar. Sri Ansari for being the chief guest and the distinguished panel of speakers for agreeing to participate in it. It is the importance of the theme of the book which has brought them together. First, I should explain why I ventured into writing this book. It has to be accepted that India has changed completely since the time the constitution was framed. It is now a vibrant multi-party democracy as compared to the hegemony of one political party, that is Congress party, at the time earlier. A current, recently, there has been a total polarization and political fragmentation of political life in the country, much more than in the United States. There is also a complete breakdown in the dialogue between the center and the states, which is a very, very troubling uh, feature. There is also, there is not even an agreement, for example, on what is, what is in national interest. We are, in a sense, back to the situation where we were when Indira Gandhi was the Prime Minister. During that time, the center state relations were as strained as they are today. So I thought uh, since we are now celebrating 75 years of India's independence, we should also take stock of how things have gone, what has gone right, what has gone wrong, and uh, take a look at what should be our course of action as we go along. Firstly, I should make clear, because there is a lot of confusion on this point, that India is not a federation. Dr. Ambedkar had made it clear in the Constituent Assembly that it is a union of states with features of federal government. And therefore, uh, to, to, to create a constant controversy on India's federation being undermined, etc., is to some extent not justified. But at the same time, it has to be accepted that states in India, as compared to a number of other countries, are the creations of the Constitution. It is Article 3 of the Constitution which makes and unmakes states, which uh, upgrades them, which downgrades them, and therefore, in a sense, the, uh, the supremacy of the Constitution cannot be overlooked. It has also to be accepted that uh, when the constitution was framed, there was a feeling that unless center is strong, India cannot hold together. And it was understandable on the background of the partition of the country. But uh, I thought it is necessary to underline 
that this is no longer the case, that this is not enough. Much more is required to treat states and center together as partners in this process of development and going ahead of the country, and therefore the importance of participative, uh, uh, participative democracy, importance of uh, um, dealing with these issues in a larger perspective. I have dealt essentially with 15 fault lines. The canvas is very large, but I had to um, um, I had to concentrate on a few of the major items which I thought are matters of concern. The uh, one fault line which has remained with us for last 75 years is Jammu and Kashmir. And there is a great deal of misunderstanding, misreading of history of uh, Jammu and Kashmir. It is often said that what constitution has given has been um, abrogated by this government, by the Modi government. I'm, I take a different view after having studied this matter at great length, and I think um, chairman of our today's meeting knows the subject better than anybody, any one of us here. But I find that the Constituent Assembly never intended to treat Jammu and Kashmir any differently than that of any other state. That it was to be like any other state, except that situation at that time was such that um, full integration was not possible as it was in respect of the other states, and therefore Article 370 was done. I have um, e examined this point at considerable length in this book because I thought it is time we understand the uh, the problem in its entirety, and therefore uh, this fault line which is there with us since the beginning, and now needs to be addressed. Though Kashmir is now constitutionally an integral part of India at last, but in terms of bonding of the valley in particular, I feel that there is much more remains to be done, and I have listed out what needs to be done in that area. The other area of concern in the fault, among the fault lines is the uh, secularism. This is something with which we started even before, even when the constitution was under the discussion, Anand Shayanam Iyengar introduced a resolution saying that there should be a ban on communal parties and there should be separation of uh, uh, political, communal political parties from political life. This was more or less unanimously agreed except for one member. And in spite of that, I'm intrigued that the Constituent Assembly did not make any provision for it in the Constitution. Certainly, it included provisions for secret secularism, but did not make it clear that there will be separation of religion from politics. And uh, towards this end, neither in the Constitution proper, nor in the fundamental rights, nor in the directive principles was any constitutional provision made. Therefore, we are uh, we are in a situation today where the whole concept of secularism is being questioned. And what I am surprised is that uh, though Jawaharlal Nehru, Indira Gandhi and Rajiv Gandhi during their, their period with a kind of massive mandate which they had, they could have easily carried out the necessary constitutional amendments. But for some reason, all these years, they did not take any action. Why is it so? It has intrigued me. An effort was made after Babri, Babri Majid was demolished to have a constitution amendment and to uh, make necessary amendments in the, uh, in the uh, Representation of People Act in 1993. This again fell through because an inadequate consultations amongst the political parties and they were not taken into confidence before moving these bills and therefore they had to be withdrawn. We are now in a situation where uh, the concept of secularism itself is being questioned. And I have serious problem. A country which has 20% minority population cannot really continue forever without uh, conceding the demands or without conceding the legitimate rights of the minorities. And this is something which uh, is, fall is falling by wayside and therefore I, I believe that this fault line is of particular concern to us. 
then I have then I have looked at uh, some of the issues which have um, caused conflict between the center and the states. Earlier days, it was Article 356 and use of uh, use of the power indiscriminately to impose president's rule. Fortunately, after 1994 uh, Bombay judgment of the Supreme Court, this has more or less been completely put stop to because because Supreme Court has reiterated the original objective of this article that it will be used only in extreme emergencies and not as a political convenient tool for the ruling party. But the other problem is of the institution of governors. And our chairman was a governor of a state for over 10 years, and he knows this subject again better than any one of us. But I thought I should highlight that this is a this is an anachronism. This is taken from, uh, from the period of British rule, which was suitable at that time, but is not really suited for a democracy, for a Republican uh, structure, which we have been operating for the last 75 years. And therefore, uh, one finds increasingly, there is this conflict between the, between the governors and the state government, elected state governments. And I think this whole institution needs a second look. And therefore, I have at least come to a conclusion that uh, there is no other alternative but to, but to abolish this institution. You will be surprised. But I'm, I have come to this conclusion because I found that none of the uh, guidelines suggested by any one of the uh, any one of the commissions of inquiry so far or by the Supreme Court have been adhered to by any of the governments which have been in power in for the last 70 years, neither Congress, nor the BJP, nor United Front government or any one of them. And therefore, let us accept that there are some things which are not workable, that governors are looked upon as by the ruling party as their representative and not the representative of the uh, of the president, and this is where the rub lies. And therefore, finally, I think we should come to a conclusion that uh, the, uh, this institution should be abolished. I have analyzed uh, um, uh, article by article powers which are given to the governor, which can be given to the other authorities concerned. And therefore, uh, I believe that uh, a second look urgently needs to be taken about this institution. One more point I should uh, concentrate on, and that is uh, the uh, role of the Supreme Court. When the Constitution was made, uh, it was it was pronounced that this cannot be a third chamber, etc. But this is this has been a thing of the past. It is the Supreme Court in India is now more than a third chamber. In fact, it is the only chamber which functions in our uh, country in various respects. And therefore, uh, major constitutional issues receiving back, back, um, back seat in terms of consideration of the Supreme Court is something which has bothered me. And I think the, the Federation cannot continue uh, or hold together unless there is a quick decision on a number of issues. For example, take the case of Article 370. Um, number of uh, petitions have been pending in the Supreme Court. Um, uh, amendment of the citizens, uh, uh, citizens, uh, citizens uh, Citizenship Act. Um, uh, number of issues pertaining to habeas corpus, something which ought to be given uh, attention to on a priority, but have not received attention again because of lack of time. Appellate side of the work is so heavy that the Supreme Court finds it very difficult to spare enough judges for the for looking at the constitutional matters. And therefore, I have suggested time has come, as it was suggested several years ago by, um, by the uh, Law Commission of India, that uh, Supreme Court should be divided into two divisions, appellate division and a constitutional division. And I have suggested that there should be this separation. Uh, nine full-time judges should be set apart for looking into constitutional issues. And as compared to what happens now, I have suggested that all nine judges should sit together while deciding every constitutional issue, not as at present a minimum of five judges, etc. And I have argued why is it necessary and what advantages it would have. 
but I think this is something which is urgently required. One more point I should mention, which is which has become of concern now, and which is the uh, um, which is the state domicile concept. When several years ago, uh, the, so the, the Supreme Court itself took a view that the Constitution foresaw only national domicile and not a state domicile. Unfortunately, that decision of the Supreme Court was set aside by a full bench of the Supreme Court later, and they said, no, there should be a state domicile itself. I don't want to go into legal issues because I don't have the uh, capability or credibility to go into these matters, but on a limited point, in terms of what should be the limits of uh, uh, state uh, 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 states powers in terms of uh, uh, in, in terms of operating, for example, practically dozen states have now passed resolutions to say that only people domiciled in their state will get employment in their state. And 75%, 80%, UP has gone to the extent of saying 90% of vacancies, not only in the government, but also in the private sector, will be given uh, to the uh, domiciled persons in that state. These are clear according to me, infringement of Article 15, which says you cannot discriminate on the basis of uh, place of birth, and 16, which says that there should be equal em employment of opportunities for everybody. In fact, this undercuts the fundamental rights given by the Constitution itself, and therefore time has come when we must seriously take a look at how to deal with this issue. This is a highly sensitive issue, I'm aware, and I'm surprised that these resolutions these enactments are being talked about and passed by successive governments without government of India taking any cognizance of where these are leading us. Then the last point which I would like to talk about, and this is the undercurrent, increasing undercurrent of subnationalism which is surfacing now. This is something which worried the the, um, the leadership at the time when the uh, states reorganization commission was formed and the uh, states uh, on the basis were formed on the basis of uh, linguistic states were formed and even at that time nehru and patel had worried that had worries that this will lead to uh, subnationalisms uh, uh, creating problems over a period of time and not uh, too, 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 too many years apart, this has come true now. And we find that each state is, is um, um, more or less aggressively pursuing uh, its so-called asmita, its so-called self-respect, identity, which is an issue which JNK is often talking about. This has become now an issue everywhere. All states are now talking about having a separate constitution, a separate, a separate flag, a separate um, uh, 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 separate uh, state uh, uh, song uh, uh, like, a, like a national anthem, etc. These are all uh, situations which are likely to create serious difficulties for federalism. Finally, uh, the emphasis of the new government, uh, present government, on smaller states. This is something which is bothering me a great deal. So people are already talking about uh, dividing West Bengal, dividing uh, uh, number of other states, even Tamil Nadu, because uh, it suits political uh, ambitions from time to time to have smaller states. But in terms of keeping a balance between the center and the states, I think it is leading us into a very, very difficult situation. And therefore, this whole policy it needs a review, which I have discussed at considerable length. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. These are a few points which I thought I should place before you. I would now, uh, if uh, Dr. Ansari Saab is online, I would like to request him to kindly release the book and to please address the audience thereafter. Is Ansari Saab there? Very much so. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ansari Saab. Welcome. Uh, may I request you to please release Dr. Goldboyle's book and then be pleased to speak to us. Thank you very much, Murasab. The book is right here, and uh, 
I don't know how a virtual release is done. Well, all, all, all you say is there is a release and we take it as released. So it can be. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Vora Sab. Uh, Dr. Godwole and a very distinguished panel of speakers. To my mind, Dr. Godbole is nothing if not prolific. He produces a tome literally at the drop of a hat. The list of his publications testifies to it and so does his unwavering focus on matters relating to state policy in contemporary India. The volume before us is a substantive piece of research on a matter of immediate relevance. We are all familiar with the first line of Article 1 of the Constitution of India, which states, and I quote, India, that is Bharat, shall be a union of states, unquote. The expression shall be in the text visualizes the objective to be achieved. And the text of the article defines the physical contours and of the existing and future contents of what is intended to be a union of states and union territories. The focus of Dr. Godbore's book is on the meaning of the concept of union and its fault lines, challenges, and opportunities. He recalls in this context the late Shri Durga Das's 1969 remark that the stability of the union will depend on two matters, one, center state relations, and to Kashmir. The preface is delightfully candid. He cites Ambedkar and Dr. Rajendra Prashad to underline the point that the working of the constitution will essentially depend not so much on the text as on the people who operate it. He highlights the point that, and I quote again, Majoritarianism is the curse of democracy, unquote, since it impedes discussion and debate. He draws attention to its linguistic, sectarian, racial, and provincial connotations, and in this context, cites the remark of a minister of Indira Gandhi emergency cabinet that, and I quote that minister, a party with two-thirds majority using three-line whip could change the constitution in 24 hours. Two long chapters, almost a third of the book, relate to the Kashmir question in its entirety and to the occasions on which the decisions taken or not taken could have been less subjective. The end result, he writes, is that India is clearly in a cul-de-sac. The author's <laughs> recipe for a solution and for integration, peace and normalcy may not necessarily produce the desired results. The public disquiet is evident. A recent visitor to the valley who went as a tourist, returned with the impression that matters have deteriorated to the point that, and I quote him, Indians are hated, unquote. An editorial in the Indian Express of September 21 is equally candid, and I quote that section of the editorial, that more than two years after the revocation of Jammu and Kashmir's special status, the much-hailed integration 
is nowhere in sight. Only the naive, tone deaf or the uncaring would mistake the outward absence of anger and resentment as a sign of normalcy." Unquote. The unstated major premise in domestic political discourse on different areas are often Islamophobic in that, using that somewhat impolite uh, expression, to mention in political parlors, except in the context of otherness. The major impediments to the problem of a federal India cited in the book are intermixing of religion and politics, linguistic states, and the rise of subnationalism, the Frankenstein of domiciliary requirements, and the official language. The arguments in each case makes impressive reading, given the author's command over facts and precedents. I recall that in November 2017, New Delhi played host to an international conference on federalism in which the experience of different federal models the world over was examined. One of its themes was accommodating diversities. One participant pointed out that diversity is a social fact, all that diversity as a social fact always existed in the world at large, but becomes a problem mainly when it exists within the territory of a state, often when different groups perceive one another as inferiors or superiors. Hence the need to focus on the constitutional principle of equality and ensure that identity is emancipatory and not hegemonic. The final chapter on cooperative federalism offers practical and doable correctives. It refers to the crisis in the judiciary and to the workload and delays in redressal of grievances. It points out that since its inception in 1990, only 11 meetings of the Interstate Council were held till July 1919, the last being in July 2016. And it reiterates the suggestion that there should be a constitutional court along with a court of appeal with the latter dealing with routine matters. In regard to the judiciary, an Indian ailment of verbosity in court proceedings seems to defy all attempts at correctives. The practice in the United States Supreme Court is to allow contending parties 30 minutes each, 30 minutes each for verbal arguments. When I mentioned this some years back to an eminent legal luminary, the response was that our preference for long presentations is conventional. I was confronted with the same problem in the Rajya Sabha during the zero hour presentations. And our corrective there was to pro program the microphone for three minute recordings only. It did produce some results though not comprehensively. Dr. Godbole concludes the book with some sobering observations and I quote him, a federal structure cannot work without viable mechanisms for center state and interstate consultations. It is time alternate mechanisms are ad adopted, unquote. He suggests, and I quote again, the adoption of new a new chapter 
on Indian federalism by pursuing the objective of cooperative federalism, which has remained on paper so far, except in the solitary case of the GST. This is not going to be an easy task and will require a complete change in the mindset of the center and of the states. Here then lies the challenge, identified with precision by the author and with a solution. We need a constitutional un unity, not a superficial one, oneness. The alternative may bring forth constitutional and political chaos or some form of dictatorship premised on misplaced homogenizing ideological notion of a united India whose end result may well be its very antithesis. Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ansari Sahib, for your pretty and very significant observations. Now, as per the schedule of this afternoon discussion, Dr. Godbole has asked me to also say a few words. Now, our director, Mr. Srivastava, spoke at some length about Dr. Godbole's background and qualifications. But I think he missed mentioning a very important fact relating to Dr. Godbole, and that is he and I joined service together. <laughs> and that was at the time the first Prime Minister of India. Uh, for personal reasons, he chose to seek uh, premature retirement in 1993. And thereafter, devoted himself day and night to scholarship, to research. And as uh, our director mentioned, he has 26 books to his credit and hundreds and hundreds of articles in various magazines, journals. And as uh, Ansari Saab mentioned just now, Gord Bole produces a book for like a drop of a hat. Well, my congratulations and my greetings and compliments to him. Now, I have a little basis <clears throat> because he's a scholar and I'm not of uh, wasting any time in trying to disagree with his identification of the fault lines or of what he believes would have been a better arrangement. And where have our faults been? What are our challenges? And what is it that we can do today by way of using the situation as an opportunity to do much better? Now, the question of ours being a multi-party democracy uh, is uh, not, I would say, either a fault line or a failure. It is the way our polity has evolved from about 50 odd parties in the whole country, state and the nation, we are something like 26, 2700 parties of which 90% are unrecognized and yet they create all the problems that you need to do. Amongst the many other things that he mentioned and uh, comments, he has devoted over 100 pages to the so-called fault line of Kashmir, which is, in my view, not a fault line, but a trench line. It is a huge pit, an uh, un unfordable trench. And he has given his reasons, his comments on what went wrong, what didn't go right. And in his remarks just now, while introducing the book, he has uh, spoken again about uh, uh, two, three things. He talks of uh, uh, secularism, our failures, Article 356, our failures, 
the deplorable issues relating to the institution of governors, which he recommends to be done away with. I think these wretched fellows don't need to be noticed very much, whether you keep them or send them away. <laughs> because they refused this constitutional, the constitutional post. They were like the CCTV of the constitution. They were reduced to party posts. Control of this uh, Supreme Court, Article 370, uh, CA on the, the domiciliary issues, subnationalism, the uh, new dividing lines, confrontations which are developing, which have developed. Having said all that, he uh, talks about the need for a new cementing force to bond the country together. And in this process, he speaks uh, uh, quite legitimately and rightly about the failures of the Interstate Council, to which uh, Zari Saab mentioned just now, the failure of uh, center state relations. And uh, then, then uh, not a very long chapter on the way forward, in which he talks about uh, union territories, uh, whether they should be there or not there, need for establishing a constitutional court, need for establishing a commerce and trade and commerce authority of a country, GST, and so on. But in all this process, he uh, rightly mentions that he has no hope of uh, healthier conventions appearing on the scene on their own. But he still insists on underlining the requirement of new arrangements, new institutions, while very much admitting that the process of modifying the constitution is by no means easy. Two thirds of both houses, half the state legislatures concurring and so on. But the essential question is, which political party with that kind of majority and sway in the country would like to bring about all these changes? That is an associated question. So I will not go into the, the, the more on the what he says about the way forward, the reform of Rajya Sabha amendment of Article 15, uh, and so on and so forth. He makes one reference, and I wish he had spoken a little more, a little, little more, about the weakening of the center in terms of its capacity, its resources, its will to safeguard national security. In this context, he quotes from a portion of the Task Force of National Security after the Kargil War, Kargil Review Committee and Group of Ministers. Uh, I, I, it, it happened, so happened that I had chaired this uh, committee's report. Upon me. I wrote this report. Now, the basic point Dr. Godwole makes is that it is the, under Article 355, it is the duty of the Union to safeguard the states against external aggression, war, and internal disturbance. And why is it that so many years have elapsed and we have not administered the provisions of this article? Even the properties and assets of the Union of India in the states cannot be safeguarded without the concurrence of the states. The central armed police forces cannot be deployed in any part of India without the first the concurrence of the states and so on. So I will not go into the details, but I dare say that this is a very, very important area of concern, which one cannot gloss over. Now, my own view, uh, just as uh, Dr. Goldbole's views are based on 25, 27 years of very hard work and research, uh, I dare say that my views, such as they are, are based on an equally long period of exposure to governance in the states, in the field. Uh, circumstantially, after retirement, I, I got involved in, in one of the other assignments, which kept me away for almost 25, 25 years. Now, my own perception is that uh, 
the continuous failures that uh, Dr. Gorbole has referred to, giving good reasons, are essentially, and it is for Dr. Justice Shaw to speak authoritatively about, essentially due to the fact that the three organs of the Constitution, mainly the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary, each one of them has failed successively and competently. Now, there are many, many reasons, and I, I don't have the time really to go into them. But I would say that on a, on a generic basis across the board, the failure pan India is due to manipulative politics, lack of democracy, inner party democracy, lack of accountability of political parties and their echelons. You make the most of what you have and go away, get away, leaving nothing behind. The next party comes, starts all over again and does what it can or what it can't. And that party too goes away, not leaving anything which can be mentionably cited or quoted. Now the one of the reasons of manipulative politics and uh, an unreliable environment which now pervades the land is due to the grave, grave defects in our electoral system. Now, there have been several committees in the years past while I was in service, done very, very wonderful work. Law Commission reports are there on what reforms are needed, but nobody has had the guts, the courage, or the interest to really execute these reforms. One of the reasons of the failure of the executive, one I mentioned because there are very many, is the politicization of the entire administrative system. From Patwari to Chief Secretary, you politicize the whole system. You started by politicizing, now in the last many years, you communalize the whole system. Caste, color, creed, must get preference. I want to point a chief secretary, he should be this particular subcast. I want a DG from certain part of my state and so on. Now you cannot manage or efficiently govern a country of our size with 4,600 communities, 122 constitutions or noted languages, several thousand dialects, and communities whose socio-religious, socio-cultural traditions are embedded in thousands and thousands of years of history and tradition. Diversity of a kind which is difficult, almost impossible to describe. So I would therefore say that sensitivity of which must imbue the part of gov the governance structures must possess that sensitivity to be able to manage and govern a diverse society. Now, talking about the legislatures, uh, same kind of people who constitute the state cabinets, the Council of Ministers, they sit in the House. Now, we have for years been talking about the criminalization of politics. What have we done about it? A recent report, uh, which appeared in the national papers, says as high a percentage as 40 3.5% of all elected elements in the state legislatures and the central parliament have one or the other kind of question mark of a criminal background. Proven or not proven, FIR, charge sheet, whatever. Now you can well imagine if near half of the legislature is comprised of people who have different interests in the country, who will run the system? And one of the things which has arisen from deep-seated, widespread, sustained politicization of the administrative structures is corruption and uncountability. And without accountability, you cannot have the rule of law. The foundation of rule of law in the Constitution is accountability. The foundation of good governance is accountability. We have eroded it. We have destroyed it. So I would say in brief, 
executive has failed, the appointed executive, the elected executive, the legislature, and sadly, the one organ of the constitution, which when I joined service and for many years after that, which would ring the warning bell, which would bring people to their heels, was the superior judiciary. Now, unfortunately, it's a sad thing to say that questions have been raised not only about the, the lower judiciary, the intermediate judiciary, but questions have been asked as high a level as the August level of the Chief Justice of India. Questions of integrity. At the lower level, there are large questions of competence and lack of honesty. Several crore cases, a large percentage of which are criminal cases, are pending across the land because judges have not been appointed or not provided to office accommodation or not given the wherewithal to run their courts, etc., etc. So where does one go from there? With 40 million cases pending in various courts, there is no justice. Justice delayed is justice denied. So, and the other two things which I would uh, 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 like to mention in brief, the failures that Aksar Godbole is talking about, I think two other failures which are major failures are inequity, inequality, and our failure to remove poverty, alleviation of poverty. The funds and the programs mentioned are allocated authorized for removing poverty or reducing poverty, the fund, even these funds are embezzled or eaten up. They are scandals. So I would say that the, in end, the politicization and even the communalization of institutions of governance, and I dare say that our constitution provides for a countrywide network of statutory and constitutional institutions, which, if run properly, provide for a common framework of governance around the country, efficient, good governance. Now, if there is no public order, there is no maintenance of law and order, there is no calm on the ground, how will you achieve development? Sustained development emerges from public order and sustained peace and normalcy. If you continue to have disturbances in various parts of the country, various points of time on a running basis, and your adversaries and your enemies are finding it a golden opportunity to create sabotage, subversion, even a proxy war in our country, then you can imagine what lies in store for us. I will close uh, my observation by quoting from uh, two extracts from Dr. Goldgolin's book, which uh, I am mentioning particularly to underline the point that it is not so much the letter and word of the Constitution as Justice Shah will be telling us, it is those who run it, who are the people who run the Constitution of India. And here you are, Dr. Rajendra Prashad, President of the Constituent Assembly, while speaking on the motion for adoption of the Constitution on November 49, had with great foresight said, whatever the Constitution may or may not provide, the welfare of the country will depend upon the way in which the country is administered. That will depend upon the men who administer. Ansari Saab made reference to that. After all, a constitution like a machine is a lifeless thing. It requires life because of the men who control, control and operate it. And then again, a brief quotation from Dr. Baker. The working of the constitution does not depend wholly upon the, on the nature of the constitution. The constitution can provide only the organs of state 
such as the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. The factors on which the working of the organs of the state depends are the people and the political parties they will set up as, they, as the, their instruments to carry out their wishes and their politics. Who can say how the people of India and their parties will behave? It is therefore futile to pass any judgment upon the constitution without reference to the part that the people and their parties are likely to play." Unquote. One last sentence. I have been saying it earlier in uh, not an academic uh, forum uh, with people like Gold Bowl around, but in a less informed forum that the quality of the quality and the quality of the public services, the public servants, from the Patwari at the village level to the cabinet secretary in Delhi, their loyalty, their devotion, their competence, their honesty, and the leadership role of the political elected people, that combined can save this country. And if we keep on going the way we are, then perhaps Dr. Gord Bole is right and I'm wrong. Thank you very much. Now I, I have the, the uh, privilege of uh, calling upon um, uh, Dr. Kucharan Das is the next speaker on our list. Uh, he has uh, just uh, been mentioned. He's a political analyst, he's an author. He is a great commentator. And uh, most of all, he is one of our distinguished members of the IAC. Dr. Kucharan Das, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Gora uh, just Mr. Gurcharan Das, not Doctor. Anyway, I've let me say, I've enjoyed this book and I've learned a lot from it. So my congratulations to the author who has been highly productive in Pune after his innings as an administrator. I agree with much that has been said in the book and certainly both Ansari Saab and Vora Saab have plowed the field rather broadly. So what I'll do is I'll confine myself to two, two areas. One is a fault line that has been identified by Madhav Godbole and the other is in fact the opposite. So let me begin um, and let me add the, the fault line that he identifies is language. <laughs> In 1947, tired Englishmen worn down by the world war packed up and left India without firing a shot leaving behind absently, absent-mindedly the English language, which has, which has been a headache for Indians who still can't decide what is their national language. So India was born under the shadows of Hitler, Stalin and Mao created by saints. And it was because of that first generation of saints that ruled India, that India did not fall into the trap of Pakistan and Sri Lanka. As you all know, <coughs> Pakistan lost half its country, Bangladesh, because Mr. Jinnah insisted on making Urdu the national language when Urdu, Urdu was understood only by 7% of the people of Pakistan. The same uh, problem occurred in Sri Lanka, where an arrogant leadership denied the Tamil minority its language. And it led to a civil war in which the nation lost a whole generation. So what is the lesson? The lesson is that language is not that something you can impose on people. Remember, a nation is an imagined community. 
There's nothing natural about it. And language is also an invented device, nothing that's given by God to a people. So in multinational countries like India, multilingual countries like India, we should not impose and the state should not try to do this kind of social engineering. Languages grow organically. Take the example of the English language, one of the more recent languages in the world. I don't know if you know, but it grew up, it grew organically in the bazaars of England in the 14th century, when the Norman aristocracy spoke French, the learned clergy spoke Latin. And when the bazaar folks wanted to write the Bible in English, they burned them on the stake. But in a hundred years, England produced Shakespeare. And then from there, it is English is now the global language. Shakespeare borrowed freely from many languages, and that has made it useful, has also helped it to become a global language. So, so, so 75 years after independence, it is time for us, 74 years, whatever, to admit that English is an Indian language. And Madhav Godbole rightly says that it should be part of the eighth schedule of the Constitution. The language no longer belongs to England. England had lost it long ago, lost its property rights on it to America, to Canada, to Australia, New Zealand. And it's only a matter of time that India, in, the English speakers in India will cross the number in the United States and become the largest, India will become the largest English speaking country in the world. And I don't know what kind of English we'll be speaking after another 70 years, when our next 75th birthday comes about. That's anyone's guess. But, but I personally think it will be a variant of English. The language of Bollywood, of FM radio, of advertising, and of what I had called about English, the language of the bazaar. Now, will English produce a Shakespeare in 100 years or for 75 years? Who knows? The, 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 the bottom line is that a state should let the bazaar rule in this case. It should, should not socially engineer a language. And this is really, the French made this mistake. They have this Académie Française, and which tries to socially engineer the French language. And so they, you can see the decline of France, France and French as a, partly as a result of that. So quickly, the idea of a national language is a dangerous myth. It's a myth of national, the 19th century nationalists and of the murderous 20th century. So, yes, I must say that uh, I too some, feel sometimes very sad that if somebody a non-English speaker entered into this webinar, that person, an Indian, who was very bright but did not understand English, that person would feel death. And, and, and that bothers me to have people feeling death in our own country. And it's probably 85% of the people. So there is something odd about it, but 
at the same time, you know, our, our failure has been that here, after 70 years of great opportunity, the great advantages that we have with English, that we don't, our children cannot speak it because they don't have teachers. So a simple idea, there's an app on your phone. There's an app on your phone, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls in the audience, and it's called Hello English. Just download it. And I bet I can give you a bet that within three months, you'll be speaking a thousand words of English fluently. Bazaar, enough for being, you know, enough for spoken English. Anyway, this is not the subject of actually uh, Madhav's book, but the. So I think I've made my point and I won't labor it anymore. The second issue that Madhav deals with and that I want to spend a few minutes on, and that is GST. I think Madhav has rightly pointed out that this is really one of the best far reaching reforms that has been made in the country. And despite the glitches, despite the criticism, GST is a giant foot forward for the country. It was, I believe, unfairly derided, and Madhav quotes that, by Rahul Gandhi calling it Gubber Singh tax, GST. Uh, it's still evolving, but the key point here is not the tax itself. The key point that Mr. God, Godbole has pointed out that it is the best model today we have of cooperative federalism. And today, if we had the same institutions like, like the GST Council, if we had such an institution, it would be much easier to get the far-reaching reforms enacted. Imagine if we had had such an institution before the farm laws were announced. Now, we all know that reforms have to be implemented by the states. And you need, you know, the reformers, of course, have failed us because they have not sold the reforms to the people right from uh, Narsimha Rao down for the last 20, 30 years, the, since 1991. But you, if you have an institution like the GST, uh, an empowered group like the GST Council, um, you have a better chance of getting things like farm laws, labor laws. These are very important legislations of reform. And since the reformers refuse to educate the people, this is one way to do it. And Madhav rightly pointed out, the interstate council has been a failure. And so we need something else. And this is the one so far, the shining example of an interstate body that has been successful. Now it's evolving. We need the GSD needs to evolve further. We need to move to a, a, a revenue neutral tax. We need to have fewer rates. But wow, the fact that we this tax has added 4.5 million tax entities. It's shown a buoyancy even, I mean, uh, uh, th th that we could not imagine, uh, I mean, until the pandemic struck. It's removed these silly state barriers, silly octroys, and resulted in the private sector huge reduction in transaction costs. And it's done more to make India one than almost anything except Bollywood and cricket. So now GST needs to 
slowly absorb electricity, petroleum, real estate, that is stamp duty, and even alcohol. But imagine we are moving towards a nirvana in indirect tax, one tax on indirect. Anyway, I've had, I've spoken enough, I think. And uh, uh, I think we all want to hear Justice Shah. So I'll just uh, close, but make one small point that Madhav talked about his worry about subnationalism and i the thought that came through my mind was that the small states that he decried are actually a countervailing force against state nationalism or state chauvinism and so i'm see at least up needs to be broken up i think we'd all agree okay with that note thank you all thank you very much uh, dr Shab. Uh, I now call upon uh, Justice Shah to please speak to us. Thank you, Varaji. A good evening to everyone. It is a pleasure to be invited here today to discuss Dr. Madhav Gurgore's latest book, India, Federal Union of States, Fault Lines, Challenges and Opportunities. Like Dr. Gurgore's entire body of writing, this book is erudite and insightful. It is a thought-provoking read and certainly made me reconsider many questions about what we have learned about the Indian state, as well as appreciate new perspectives around old ideas. As Dr. Gorgole points out, federalism under the Indian constitution is a very challenging concept. He poses a very interesting question in the preface, whether India will become a Commonwealth of States, a United Nations of India, or remain a Federal Union of States. And he quotes Meghna Desai by saying that the why it is not, why it is difficult because of a deep insecurity about admitting diversity without attributing a lack of patriotism. Challenges about Indian federalism abound size, diversity, economic viability, vary across states, and now the changing dynamics of, of fiscal federalism. Under the current dispensation at the center, some new fault lines emerge, such as an extremely strained relationship with opposition rules, states like Kerala, West Bengal, uh, having passed, states having passed CA resolutions against the center and taking the matters in the court, new concepts like one nation, one election, one nation, one market, I mean, they are debatable and they put a, a great pressure on the, on the concept of federalism. But the most troubling is the revival of an emboldened Hindu majoritism and its linguistic sectarian and provincial attachments. Dr. Gurgole calls, uh, I mean, uh, Ansari ji mentioned it, I will repeat it again. Dr. Gurgole in unequivocal terms calls majoritism yes, the sir. curse of democracy. It led to partition and with its current rise to the commanding heights of power and the idea of a Hindu Rashtra dominating discourse, the threat is real. Spin off concerns persist of polarizing and divisive, divisive communism, othering of minorities, hate culture, cultural nationalism, <coughs> and an indigenous brand of elected autocracy. Along with failing institutions and open challenges to fundamental democratic principles such as secularism, <laughs> free thought and expression, and the rule of law, the situation looks uh, very grim. But this is not the time to debate on these issues. I, I would quote before as a preview to my, my, uh, uh, my presentation, uh, I would again quote, uh, reiterate what uh, uh, Mr. Durgada said in his book, India from Karzan to Nehru and after. In the final analysis, 
any government at the center will be judged in terms of how it tackles the two issues on whose solution depends the stability of the Indian Union. These are center state relations and Kashmir. I mean, I, I have my apologies to Goraji. I mean, I won't be speaking on the judiciary the, because this book uh, also focuses on Kashmir, which is where I would uh, weigh in more because of my recent personal experiences. The book deals with the, all the developments surrounding the state, its accession to the genesis of Article 370, to the 1952 Delhi Agreement, to the Shimla Agreement, up to abrogation and bifurcation. It makes fascinating reading. My own perspective, perspective comes from my role as a member of the Forum on Human Rights in Jammu and Kashmir and a recent, recent visit there. We met delegations of panchayas and DDC members, Kashmiri Pandit representatives, Imams, activist groups, lawyers, journalists, business and trader forum, affected families and heads of regional political parties whose members were and continue to be detained. Dr. Gurbole caused the abolition of Article 370, a master stroke and a bold political move. Dr. Gurbole agrees and he said in his, in, 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 his, in his initial remarks that this Article 370 had to be incorporated in the Constitution to safeguard the position of Jammu and Kashmir in the Indian Union. It was a product of the time. He also says that an unfortunate byproduct of Article 370 was a separate constitution for JNK. He further argues that 370 was transitional and temporary and only meant to be valid till the first constituent assembly is formed. So these are debatable issues, but as pointed out earlier, more than 200 petitions are filed in the Supreme Court on 370 issue. But the court is simply avoiding the issue. When the 4G controversy happened, the Supreme Court similarly sidestepped the issue and left, to, left it to an executive-led review committee. Some lawyer commented on this. This is a wholesale delegation of judicial power. The habeas corpus petitions are also ignored. I mean, that's a, that's a very co common knowledge. So someone calls this as a judicial abrogation of rights and liberties in Kashmir. The facts on the ground points to the troubling series of events that transpired before and after the abrogation, and many of these factors are considered by Dr. Godbole in his book, including mass arrest of Kashmiri politicians, intellectuals, journalists, youth, close to 1,000 still remain imprisoned, disrupted means of communications, including internet restrictions, a blanket curfew, and increased presence of 40,000 troops. Meanwhile, the center took controversial steps that invalidated the state's residency laws and privileges, removed restrictions on land use and transfer, and denied legal rights to habeas corpus, bail, and speedy trial. In our visit, we met political leaders from all political parties. All agreed that there was simmering anger in society. With no outlet to voice views, the situation was likely to implode. Everyone also agreed that a democratic setup is needed. A situation of being under constant bureaucratic supervision, as well as under the scrutiny of the army and police, was not in the interest of the nation, the people. Most of the value-based parties we met were of the view that the restoration of special status that was given in Article 370s remains critical for them. But statehood and elections are immediately required. And this is what Dr. Godbole has said in his 12-point program on Jammu and Kashmir. Recently, Prime Minister Modi held a meeting with an open agenda, seemingly to consult regional representatives on how to restore a political process. However, the Prime Minister's offer was disappointing. He said the Reorganization Act would continue to be implemented and elections would be held for a union territory. Home Minister Amit Shah said statehood would be restored at an unspecified appropriate time. All the value based parties expressed their deep sorrow and, and resentment at the way in which they have been treated since August 9, 2019, and especially at the way they have been cast as anti national 
when they stood by India in the harshest of the times. Though the center flaunts the panchayat election as a great achievement for restoring democracy, really the panchayat and DDC members have no role to play. The state is run by the bureaucracy. Panchas are unable to perform the duties for which they were elected for. Most independent and opposition parties, Panchas and DDC members are put in hotels and need police clearance to visit their constituency. In fact, one of the Sarpanchas visited the constituency, ignoring the police advice and an FIR was filed against him. This is a Panchayat Raj only on paper. More than 70 Panchas, including from BJP, we met, all surprisingly said they wanted state elections. I dwell on the Panchayat Raj system because Dr. Gorgole headed the committee which introduced the system in JNK. All metrics that we are hoped to improve after abrogation have either regressed or remained the same. The security situation has not been improved. Figures for fatalities remain much higher than they were in 2012-2016. Counter insurgency concerns are prioritized over public, civilian, and, and human security. The impact on children and youth and women has been particularly severe. We met families, we met the NGOs working with the women and children's issues. The 2G and this lower internet penetration made it impossible to, for online classes to function properly till February 2021 when 4G was restored. Mental health is a big issue. Children live in an atmosphere of anxiety as their routine has been disturbed and the family too has become dysfunctional. Pre-abrogation, state had various commissions, including the Information Commission, Human Rights Commission, Accountability Commission, Women and Child Rights Commission, Commission for Persons with Disability, Consumer Commission, and Electricity Regulatory Commission. All of these commissions are now abolished and have not been restored even after two years. On all national indices, JNK was better off than many of the states as per official figures. At the ground level, we didn't find any positive home amongst people. The most important thing surely is the taking away of constitutional freedoms, especially for the media and the people. The slightest dissent or outcry is met with a charge under U UAPA or PSA or such like laws. Even a retweet by a local lawyer, we met that lawyer, of an article by a Supreme Court lawyer, Gautam Bhatia, on a bail order invited a fire. A mother was charged under the UAPA for meeting her son, who was a militant. Participants were charged under the UPA, UAPA in a cricket match held in the memory of a militant. Add to this the many reports of police corruption and harassment. The recent government directive that stone pelters should be denied government employment and even passports in perpetuity is another example of harshness that is unlawful. Even a murder accused can remain in parliament until convicted and can contest an election after six years of release from prison. The return of Kashmiri Pandit is a more complex issue. We met the representative of Kashmiri Pandit's both in Srinagar and, 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 uh, and Jammu. CPIM leader and convener of the People Alliance of the Bukkar Declaration said that they want a dignified return of pundits. But the pundits themselves say that they, they, there is nothing done on the ground. See, you will recall that in 2008, 3,000 pundits returned to the valley. After August 2019, fearing some violence about the resentment of abrogation, about abrogation of, of Article 370, they all went back to, back to Jammu. They want some composite colonies. They, they want some seats in the, in, the, in the new assembly. But we have the, the government has to consult local, political, religious, and community leaders. They must be all involved in, in planning for and reintegrating returning budgets, as this is the best guarantee for their security. On the issue of media rights and freedoms, the situation seems to be very grave. All lofty ideals on media rights espoused by the Supreme Court are of no use. 
the news new media policy declared by the administration adds to the boost it kills any independent journalism which might have existed there are reports of media persons being charged under the uapa or physically beaten put in custody a media outlet says anything critical of of the government the government stops feeding information normally given to journalists government advertisements are immediately stopped one media house representative said that it was virtually impossible to run a news electronic outlet and remain independent the economy is also but they may give a very rosy picture in delhi but we met the forums we understand their their problems i mean we take the small people like the shikara walas and pony walas they are all suffering at the ground level tourism is definitely picking up but they still struggling there was a complete loss of business for two years horticulture has suffered really shop licenses are not renewed after august 2019 and the shops are sometimes indiscriminately closed so they have they say that the the, uh, the rbi parameters are simply they are not in a position to make look how they the people react when this, there was a some news about the reliance opening shops the whole valley jammu kashmir they all went there was a ban so the, the these are very troublesome issues which we should be discussed with the with the with the with the local people returning to dr gorbole's book he has discussed some of these aspects he gives a fine list of recommendation in book by book detailed 12 point program restoration of statehood and holding elections and partial withdrawal of the army as essential these are points on which we agree one cannot rule by force all the time dr gorbole has not discussed the afghanistan issue in his book presumably because the book went into print before the latest development took place but we are now faced with new complexities in the region and diplomatic and real political actions have to factor in in the changed situation the fall of afghanistan has increased the security threat to india and especially for jammu and kashmir look at the the, the al qaeda is saying that the, this is about liberation of kashmir then the Uh, Jaisy Mahmood leader meeting the Afghanistan Afghanistan leader saying they will not allow the the, the land to be used for terrorist activities. But nevertheless, I believe it would be a mistake to treat this situation as necessitating or justifying a narrow security approach to JNK rather than an expansive one. The idea that security is strengthened by a clampdown on human rights and political freedoms is at best a short time solution. short term solution and that too mainly under the authoritarian regime but does not work in medium and long term because it denies legitimate grievance redressal and pushes people more radical action the india's own experience shows that security in jnk improved in peace making years of 2002 and 2012 which is started with vajpayee's efforts the you will recall that the uh, in 2000 2 to 12 before that the 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 casualty figures fell from 4000 per year to less than 50 during that time thus perhaps a return to bajpayee's expensive security expensive security approach of winning hearts and minds may be more desirable a speedy restoration of full statehood holding legislative elections and, and re- re- reconstituting various commissions with active what is wrong with the why why not a human rights commission or a rti or a bit some limited you there are protections and the like the women's and children commission why this cannot be revived i, I just need to understand and the particularly the role of the high court of jammu and kashmir i mean if every matter where the executive is involved is simply avoided perhaps i mean taking a group from the from the supreme court so this is a there is a very negative a uh, view about the about the uh, uh, about the uh, about the uh, the uh, the high court's role and the there, there is they 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 aspire for a truly independent uh, judiciary so uh, the this there is a political dialogue which necessary to tackle all these their daily hardships and and the other issues uh, as you can probably tell dr kotbole's book sets off a string of questions thoughts and comments on many fundamental issues on federalism and kashmir in india today for all those interested in these subjects i cannot recommend the book enough 
So many congratulations to Dr. Gurbhale for this very interesting, thought-provoking and timely publication. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justice Shah, for your very critical and very analytical expose on situation in Kashmir and human rights. Now, may I call upon Professor Mustafa to please take the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I must uh, congratulate uh, Mr. Godbole for coming up with yet another book. I think with all these books, he's entitled to as many as 10, 15 PhDs. My personal interest in constitutional law is in civil liberties rather than in federalism. And uh, the kind of discussion we had so far, I believe since about one third of the book is about Kashmir, we need to spend some time on the theory of federalism. And to say that, I would say that uh, in a country where diversity is all over, with as many as 33 crore gods and Mr. Bora mentioning all kinds of diversities, why we feel that if states assert their power, it would be bad for the country. Federalism is all about, and he says so, union of states, a federal union of states. If one person dominates, there is no union. There is no happy wedding if you have a highly dominant partner and the other person is absolutely subservient. There was a reference to GST, those who are doing taxation and doing federalism are shocked to see that the consultative process promised in the GST Council remains a distant dream. I believe that if we are really for federalism, which Mr. Godbole seems to be, how come he recommends deletion of position of the governor, but not 356. He says Sarkaria Commission said it, that it should be retained. And uh, Justice Venkatchalaya Commission said that it should be retained. Similarly, how come this Article 3, which says that the parliament can bifurcate states, can merge states, and now can, uh, uh, you know, reduce a state to a union territory status merely after ascertaining the views of the assembly and his paragraph about Kashmir's master stoke to which just Shah made a reference. He says this was the master stoke that the assembly was uh, not there, president rule was uh, imposed. I believe that that is absolute negation of federalism. Even though the center is not bound by the views of the state assembly. And if you recall the Telangana experience, as many as 1500 amendments were proposed by the Telangana assembly, the center did not pay any heed to them and the state was created. I think to me and just to Shah may agree with me, the real question is when there is a president's rule, the powers of the state assembly can be exercised by the parliament. But parliament cannot express the views on behalf of the assembly. The expression used in article 3 is that there has to be an expression of views by the assembly. Of course, the way we applied uh, article 3 to Jammu and Kashmir, we said the concurrence would be required. I don't think it is a master stroke. I think it was a negation of federal principles. And the real question before the Supreme Court would be whether what was done is compatible uh, with Article 3. I'm also reminded of Justice Salman Charles' judgment in Texas versus White, an old case of 1868, which has a relevance to our discussion and which would have relevance for any discussion which we have on federalism. And this is what Justice Salman said, the preservation of states and the maintenance of their governments 
are as much within the design and the care of the constitution as the preservation of the union. The constitution in all its provisions looks to an indestructible union composed of indestructible states. I think that is the essence of federalism. If union can destroy states, if union can reduce a state into two union territories, then I think there are big question marks about federalism. I understand that federalism as a form of government and political organization has nowhere been adopted on theoretical grounds of its real or hypothetical virtues. A country will definitely go for a unitary form of government if it can, but will accept federalism only if it must. And that way the situation from 1947 has not changed. We are a large country with all kinds of diversities and aspirations we have. I think federalism is the only way out. And how do you get to federalism? Our own Supreme Court in the state of West Bengal versus Union of India said, we are not a federation because there was no compact. So you need a compact, an agreement between center and states. Since everyone has spoken about Jammu and Kashmir, to me, the real question was the instrument of accession which we agreed to was that compact. And if we really follow the law of Ram, Pran Jai Par Vachan Na Jai, we should not be going back on our words. What we did about privy persons was equally bad. We promised them to join us on certain assurances. Those assurances should have been honored. As in international law, we say, pectas and servanda, that those plighted words must be <laughs> honored. In the United States, each state has a separate constitution. Even their criminal laws differ. Is U.S. a weak nation? True that the Section 5 of the Government of India Act talked of federation of a state, and we opted for union of states. But it is a union of states. It is not a union of center and states. And that is why the new Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu prefers to call central government as union government, because that is the constitutional government. Same Supreme Court, which says we are not a federal constitution, in Keshavanan and Bharti tells us that federalism is the basic structure of the constitution. We make so much of who and cry about secularism, saying that this word is not there. So what federal is also not there. Separation of powers is also not there. Rule of law is also not there. That doesn't mean that they are not the basic structure of the constitution. Recently, Supreme Court said, the word privacy is not there. Right to privacy is not there. Due process was rejected. Privacy was rejected. Yet, just as Chalmeshwar uh, is speaking in privacy, said, listen to the silences of the constitution. And I believe that any country which does not believe in federalism will face partition. Had India accepted federalism, probably we could have averted partition. Now that brings me to the whole question of uh, Kashmir and where he refers to Nehru's animosity with Raja Hari Singh. He's absolutely right about that. Refers to error of judgment by Nehru in following Mountbatten's advice and not going at war with Pakistan. And then he cites, which is very important, Shama Prasad Mukherjee, who was on board on going to United Nations. Mr. Godbole discusses at length the whole question whether 370 was temporary. He quotes Justice M.C. Chagla, very eminent Chief Justice of Bombay High Court, subsequently the minister at the union. Look at Article 369, which is coming just before Article 370. The heading of this part is temporary and is special. Now when something is temporary, a period is mentioned. In Article 369, specifically it is said 
that for five years on these matters of the content list, center would legislate. He quotes Sampat Prakash. But strangely, Sampat Prakash judgment of the Supreme Court itself does not quote Prem Nath Kaur, which is another five judge bench. One five judge bench overrules another five judge bench without even referring to it. And Great Justice Hidayatullah was on both the benches. Supreme Court subsequently said, well, 370 stays and presidential orders can be issued under it. If 370 was temporary, it was only till the constant assembly of Jammu and Kashmir had met, which basically what the text says, then all the presidential orders which we have issued, including the master stroke of 5th of August, they are invalid. True, what Nehru was saying or Anger was saying was simply this, that the final decision is to be taken by the constant assembly of Jammu and Kashmir. I'm surprised Mr. Godbele has not even referred to the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir, which was extremely important. People say Kashmir has now integrated. Justice Shah just told us how much is that integration on the ground. But fundamentally, the text of the uh, this Jammu and Kashmir constitution specifically says that we have integrated with Union of India. And there can never be any deviation from this provision because this provision cannot be amended. You see the first sign of basic structure in Jammu and Kashmir constitution. What will be our claim to park occupied Kashmir to which lot of reference was, has been made and the resolve of the government that we will take it over. <coughs> it was Jammu and Kashmir's constitution which mentioned that territory. Otherwise, if you look at our Schedule 1, it says that the state of Jammu and Kashmir comprise territories of Indian state of Jammu and Kashmir on the commencement of the constitution, which is 1950. And therefore, the territories which were not under our control are not covered by our constitution. That reference is gone with the repeal of uh, Jammu and Kashmir constitution. I also believe that uh, the whole question of Hindu Rash, to which uh, a reference has been made, I am not sure, but uh, seniors can guide me. Uh, the idea which I get from Mr. Gord Burley's reference at three places to this, that probably BJP is for Hindu Rash. As far as my poor understanding goes, BJP has never said that their goal is to have a Hindu Rash. They have not even opposed secularism, what they were saying, that this negative secularism is not right. Advani ji is on record to say we will bring positive secularism. There will not be any appeasement of minorities, but there will be justice for all. Then he says that you have all kinds of majority governments from Indra to Rajiv and uh, Nehru even. How come this separation of religion from politics has not been done in a more a perfect manner. Well, there is already a provision in representation of People's Act. But look how judiciary has tackled the question. I have written on this that the dismissal of the three BJP governments after the demolition of the Babri Mosque were constitutionally not correct. Even though the Supreme Court in Bombay said that they were correct because there was a danger to secularism, which is the basic structure from these governments. The situation in the Congress ruled states was worse than these BJP ruled states. Now, the question is if a political party is registered, they need to take an allegiance to the Constitution and principles like secularism and democracy and socialism, etc. If really the court thought that these BJP governments were against secularism, then the remedy was deregistration of the political party to which they belong. And I believe that Supreme Court did not do that. Moreover, I believe that you need not go to 368 if you want to bring in some kind of Hindu Rash. I understand that preamble cannot be amended, that it is the basic structure of the Constitution. It can be amended only by way of addition. But in some other provision, 
it can be written that we have a, a Hinduism as a dominant cultural heritage, as Sri Lankan constitution, for instance, writes. And finally, I'm real little sad and confused. How come anyone whose commitment is to federalism would want enlargement of concurrent list? Mr. Godbole has written, he has quoted his own article also, uh, uh, where he says that uh, there should be enlargement of the concurrent list. If there is an enlargement of the concurrent list, and all of us know that between a state law and the central law, it is the central law which will prevail. He also gives the example of the agricultural market produce and then say Bihar is doing well with the abolition of Mondays. Yes, Bihar abolished Mondays in 2006. But if we look at Mekhala Krishnamurti's researches on this, traders are main beneficiaries, not the farmers. Farm size remains small, and the farmers of Bihar are forced to sell their produce at much lower prices than MSP. Even this whole three farm laws, enacting them during COVID, everyone knows if you look at our distribution of powers that agriculture is in the state list. Wherever in the concurrent list it comes in, again the reference is made to the state. And therefore I believe anything we do about agriculture, we must take a uh, state on board. And finally about governor, interesting proposal that we should abolish the position of the governor uh, and very interesting, uh, which I think uh, someone need to do more research about it. He quotes Rajendra Prasad that during his tenure, out of 2,557 bills, as many as 1,114 were reserved for the presidential assent. And then he says during 1997, uh, during 1977 to 1985, same number of bills were there, which I'm not sure the number may have changed, but only 90 were assented. I think this is a, a good subject for further research. Uh, his suggestion that instead of governors assent, the president, the speaker may certify that the bill has been passed instead of governor's address, chief minister can address. All these suggestions are good, but at least when president rule is imposed, and there is a recommendation of the governor, some kind of one can say, well, it, it is state's head of the state who recommended, even though we know that most of the governors are puppets and the agents of the center, but a better solution, which originally was there in the original constitution, that the governor should also be elected by the people of the state would be much better than abolishing the post of the governor. I understand and agree with the Mr. Gardwale that Unlike the Mughal governors who used to rebel against the central government, the governors of the British government were far more loyal and the governors of independent India preferred to follow their immediate predecessors. I'm really not convinced about pardoning power being removed because our judges do go wrong and the executive must have that power. That power should definitely be there. Uh, I'm not able to make up my mind about smaller states uh, will really weaken the bargaining power of states. And then he says too many regional parties will weaken national perspective. If you are on federalism, then the regional perspective is to be preserved and is to be celebrated as diversities are to be celebrated. Regional aspirations don't weaken nation. But as far as a suggestion of Supreme Court, nine judges uh, deciding disputes of constitutional interpretation, I think it's a welcome suggestion. After all, constitution is also a compact between people and the state. And since constitution provides the relationship of state and center, the distribution of powers is stated in the constitution, the amending power of the constitution should not be so used that the estates are at the receiving end. I would recommend this book to anyone who is interested in federalism. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mustafa, for your <clears throat> very 
sensitive and critical analysis. Uh, we are now at the end of our discussions. Uh, Dr. Munshi, I have only one question on the dashboard. That is from Mr. Pagel, am I right? Yes, sir. There others are coming. Uh, uh, only one question. Yes, sir. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Now, this question, I address myself to, to Professor Mustafa. The questioner says that our constitution rightly provides for the dominance of constitutionalism, the rule of constitutionalism. Now, our politics has got involved with caste, religion, religion, language, etc. Can the constitution assert itself to rid politics from these problems? One can't really answer this question because the constitution itself recognizes caste at least for the purposes of affirmative action. And once you have recognized caste, then the whole thing disappears. So I believe that uh, there was a suggestion, you know, coming from Gandhiji that uh, we should not have parties, individuals should contest elections. Uh, probably that would have been a better idea. But as such, we are deviating from constitutionalism. There is one thing to have a constitution. Something is written there. Constitutions may be good, constitutions may be bad. After all, Hitler also had constitution. Ultimately, the goal of the constitution is to limit the power of the state. If we are not able to restrict the power of the state, federalism, for instance, will mean restricting the power of the state, controlling center. If we are not able to do it, we are deviating definitely from the great lofty ideals of constitutionalism. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, as there is no other question, that, that uh, leaves me to now thank all of you gentlemen, eminent panelists, and call upon Mr. Nair, the publisher of this volume. He's been in this business for as long as I can remember. He would now like to speak for a few minutes, Mr. Nair. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, good evening, sir. I respect Sri Mohammed Hamid Ansari ji, Sri NN Moharaji, Justice AP Shah, Professor Mustafa, Sri Gurjaran Das, Dr. Mahav Godbade, our author, Sri KN Srivastava, the director of the IAC, ladies and gentlemen. We have uh, had a wonderful discussion today. The book, India, a Federal Union of States, takes a comprehensive look at the country's uh, unique model of federation. And as argued here today, there is a need to acknowledge the fault lines and strengthen cooperative federalism. The future of our country will indeed depend on the resolution of these issues. My duty today is to deliver the vote of thanks. But before that, I would like to say a few words about Konak's association with the author and his recent works. It was year 2017 on a visit to Pune that I happened to meet Godbale Sahab and his family offer a lovely lunch at his home. I was joined by my wife and my daughter Shivangi, who is a publishing professional based in New York. That meeting resulted in long running association. India a Federal Union of States is the third book of his that we are publishing. As stated earlier, this book deals with a very significant topic on center state relations. His previous two books, the Babri Masjid Ram Mandir Dilemma, an acid test for India's constitution and India's governance, some incisive commentary on burning issues, have already enriched on our collection. Sir. We are proud of our rich association and hope to see it growing in the future too. Now, now let me uh, turn to my assigned duty of delivering the vote of thanks. First, I would like to express my gratitude to all the esteemed speakers for being with us this evening and for their contribution to make this webinar a great success. I would like to thank Sri Hamid Ansari for sparing his valuable time and enlightening us with his insight. I also would like to thank I gratitude to see NN Moharaji for chairing the session and for his valuable comments. He has always been a dear friend of Konark and we hope to have his continuing support on all our future 
initiatives in public sector. I thank Justice A.P. Shah for being part of today's event. Judiciary is one of the foremost pillars of India's democracy. I hope the insight that he shared today will be taken not by everyone, especially by those in the media, and it will form part of our public discourse. My sincere thanks to Professor Mustafa, Mustafa for sharing his thoughts with us today. As an academic and logical scholar and as vice chancellor of a law university, perhaps you have more power than any one of us to shape the viewpoints of coming generations. May, I, may you continue inspiring students to uphold the democratic values of this network. Next, I thank Sri Gurujaran Dasji for being part of today's discussion. Your ideas have proved very important in the process of national building. The views shared by you today will resonate with everyone who has been part of this event. I have already spoken a lot about Dr. Mathav Gorbele. I formally thank him for choosing Konar Publishers. It has been a pleasure working with you, and I hope our association will continue for years to come. Finally, I would like to thank uh, uh, K.N. Srivastavaji and his ABLE team, head, uh, headed by Dr. Usha Munshiji, IAC, who extended all support and made this a successful event. I would also like to thank each and everyone who took time out here to attend this important uh, webinar with us and remain till the end of this discussion. While I am proud to have published this work, I feel it is equally important to turn our focus on the unfortunate condition of the publishing industry today. The publishing industry players are facing a turbulent time in their business as a result of the pandemic virus and needs massive support from the government. The industry has been suffering for the last two years with the limited sales and no financial support. The fate of authors, writers, publishers, printers, booksellers, bookshops, librarians, employees, the entire book chain hangs in the balance and depends on the timely responses received from the government. However, the government has turned a blind eye to the situation by not giving any special pandemic incentives. I travel in between, I find many other countries are giving a lot of incentives and help to this industry because it's a special industry, sir. Since the book is the bedrock of an educated society and its development measures, like encouraging library spending by increasing its budgets, offering subsidies and tax exemption, allowing no discount to any supplies for some time or a one-time payment to help employers and employees to tide over the crisis will go a long way in strengthening this industry. Many countries have already undertaken such measures to help the industry tide uh, over exist uh, existential challenges. I am in Dubai today. I understand here also we have given a lot of incentive to the publishing industry here. We hope our government will also provide economic stimulus packages to help us to survive the economic crisis. I have reason to say this because I spent more than 50 years in the publishing industry. In my concluding remarks, I would like to say that India has gone from strength to strength in the last 75 years. And I have no doubt in my mind that as a nation, we will overcome all challenges to emerge stronger as a federal union of states. Thank you and Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank, you. thank you for your remarks. Before closing this evening program, I would like to thank our director, Mr. Srivastava, and Dr. Usha Minshi, our chief librarian, and once again, our respectful regards and thanks to each of the eminent panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.